You are listening to Make Change Happen, the podcast from IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. In today's episode, we'll be exploring how forest and farm producer cooperatives and organizations are rising to the challenges of climate change and food security and unpicking the barriers that they face. Hello, we're here again exploring how to make change happen. I'm your host, Liz Carlyle, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to our discussion today on how forest and farmer producer cooperatives are rising to the challenge of climate change and food security. We will also look at some of the challenges and barriers they face. With me today are Duncan McQueen, Elizabeth Simadala, and Claire Shakya. And they are people who are working closely with forest and farm producers and with the practical realities of getting climate finance into the hands of those dealing with day-to-day realities of climate change. So can I invite you all to introduce yourselves? Elizabeth, can you say a little bit about what you do? Thank you very much, uh, Liz, and uh, greetings to colleagues and listeners. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to take part in today's uh, podcast. Uh, My name is Elizabeth Simadara. I'm a Ugandan young smallholder farmer and also an agripreneur. Uh, Currently the president of the Pan-Africa Farmers Organization and also the Eastern Africa Farmers Federation. So PAFO as a continental platform, we represent voices of over 80 million smallholder farmers that are members of over 80 national level farmers organizations from 50 countries of Africa that are members of our five regional farmers organizations. So I really look forward to sharing with you on how together we can make change happen. Thank you and over to you, Liz. (laughs) Thank you, Elizabeth. Claire. Uh, Good morning. My name's Claire Sakia. I'm the director of the Climate Change Group at IID. And uh, one of the things that we're really interested in is understanding why finance isn't reaching the sorts of organisations that Elizabeth is working with and try and understand actually how to begin to fix the system. That's great. Thank you. And you, Duncan? Yes, hello. I'm Duncan McQueen and I'm head of the Forest and Prosperity Work Programme at IIED. And as that name suggests, we're very much interested in treating forest ecosystems as a whole with both both the forest and the people together and seeing how we can make things work better for both forests and people. Thank you, Duncan. I think that takes us very nicely into what we're talking about today. This is the super year of climate and nature, and we're really thinking about how all these communities are facing the realities and what it means for us going forward. Antonio Guterres said of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's recent report that it was a code red for humanity. Uh, This is very serious times and we need to take serious action. But we know that many people are actually out there on the front line doing just that in various ways. So it'll be good to share some thinking on that. I think, Duncan, could you kick us off by saying, actually, what is a forest farm producer organization or how can how can our listeners understand who they are and where they are yes thanks liz what we have in the rural areas of the world are people living they they mostly make their living from from forestry or farming there are probably 1.5 billion people living on 1 to 10 hectare smallholders so so it's a very big number and they are in often remote areas, and the, often, the only way to get help is to work together. And so they establish groups of different forms, sometimes to protect their rights if they want to claim a, a territory like indigenous peoples, and sometimes to work together to, to generate income in farmers' cooperatives and so on. And the the interesting thing about these organizations, and I'm putting the emphasis on the organization, is that it's really organization that helps them unlock their potential in places where nobody else is helping them. So local groups uh, maybe 
work together to sell something in a bigger volume to get a better price from a buyer. But you can also form regional groups that maybe work together to establish um, a processing facility, maybe for sawing timber or for storing, aggregating and storing coffee or something like that. And those regional groups often provide services like finance or technical support to the local groups. And then at national level, you can have these uh, unions or federations that join up the voices of many farmers and forest workers to, to speak with government powerfully. And, and it's those levels of organization that really um, enable us to channel voices and, and, and needs upwards and also could act as a conduit, a flow through which um, the international community helps all of those people on the ground because all of the communication channels are in place. Thank you. And before we go to Elizabeth, who I think will tell us a lot more about how effective that organisation of sort of the cooperatives is, I think one of the things you said to me the other day, which really struck home to me, was that this really significant body of people is actually the place where the poorer members of society get access to their food. You know, that this this kind of group of people producing all the things they produce is a vital source for many people in the world who can't afford, I suppose, the more expensive food sources. Yeah, ab is, is absolutely that, right. Is, yeah. I mean, that's right. I mean, there are 483 million farms there or thereabouts in the world, and 98% of them are, are family farms. And um, for poorer people, they're not getting their money from fancy supermarkets and, uh, you know, retail outlets and ordering online. They're getting their food from, from farmers markets that are, that are supplied by these smallholder farms. So it's a, if we're interested in, in you know, uh, food security for the poor, then we have to be working with these sort of smallholder farmer organizations, not your big multinationals. And this is an important point, too, for, for the first UN Food Summit that will be coming up in September, of course. This, this whole angle is another side to this argument. Well, that, that's right. And, and they're often dismissed because individual smallholders are very small scale. Um, we, had, uh, we put out a report that's called Small But Many Is Big. <laughs> and, yeah. and essentially, it, if, if you tot up the annual value from all these smallholder farmers, an estimate from IUCN said it was 1.3 trillion US dollars. And that's much, much bigger than any of the large scale corporates. So Elizabeth, perhaps, perhaps we can move to you. And can you tell us a little bit more about the FPPOs in Africa? You know, you gave us uh, some lovely figures at the beginning about the organization and the structure. Can you tell us how those organizations are affected by climate change or the, the challenges of today? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Liz. Before I can even speak about uh, the FFPOs, I, I think just picking it up from where Duncan stopped uh, is just to emphasize that speaking about the food systems, especially the, the summit that is coming up uh, in September, we really need to put uh, smallholder farmers at the center of the food systems because you cannot talk about food minus talking about uh, smallholder farmers who are the producers of this food. So uh, as Duncan mentioned, I think for us, we believe in a saying that united we stand and divided we fall. So the stronger we are together, the more chances and opportunities you know, to be listened to to form a stronger constituency, and the more we are able to reach uh, our membership. Because as we've mentioned, um, uh, most of our um, African population and, um, and farming systems are small holding. So if you are to reach out to every individual farmer, it is very much uh, challenging. And that's why uh, we join uh, forces together. We aggregate ourselves so that we can have one common voice, we can even uh, maximize in terms of uh, offering of services uh, that are in a well-coordinated uh, manner. So we use the farmer 
associations and the cooperative uh, concept uh, where we aggregate at different levels, as has already been mentioned by Duncan, uh, from national level, I've mentioned over 80 national farmers organizations that are our members. At regional level, we have the regional farmers uh, associations now who deal with the regional economic uh, communities. And also at continental level now, we have the, the PAFO platform, which uh, connects well with the African Union, you know, to bring up all the issues that are coming up uh, from the grassroots up to, to that level. So um, back to the issue of, uh, of climate change as forest and, and, and farm uh, producer, cooperatives and farmers. Of course, before we even talk about climate change, we first of all need to appreciate the importance of the forests because they are really um, very key for, for life. Uh, most, of, uh, most of us depend on them for life in many ways. Uh, for food, so there is also the uh, employment and income. So of course, it's across the value chain. And also, we all know that there is also the uh, rainfall formation. They are home for so many um, animals and birds. And also, it's also of, of oxygen, as we all know. But uh, again, as we speak, these have all been threatened by, by climate change. Of late, we've seen the predominance of extreme shocks, that is in terms of both the, the wet shocks and also the dry shocks. In terms of uh, the wet shocks, you, you know the recent uh, cyclones in the, in the southern of Africa, most of the African parts, uh, West Africa and so on, have been um, badly hit by the, by the dry spell. We've seen the recent increase in the occurrence of pests and diseases like the fall armyworm, the desert locusts, and also all this has, has led to you know, a change in the, in the cropping um, cycle, of course, which makes it, again, uh, very difficult for farmers to use their traditional knowledge in terms of, um, you know, planning for the, for the uh, cropping cycles. So, again, when it comes to, because of these changes, there is always a lack of information in terms of um, uh, weather information, which can be offered to, to, to farmers so the kind of work that we are doing as, as of course, as farmers' organizations, like I mentioned, we need to, we are always a, a voice of, uh, of farmers' organizations at different levels. And we are leading in the climate change um, farmer-led agenda at global level, dubbed uh, the climate makers, where as farmers' organizations, we are taking lead in terms of profiling the success stories uh, on ground. That's, that's great to hear, Elizabeth. And I guess it would be wonderful for our listeners. I mean, as a smallholder yourself or sort of the number of smallholders you must know, do you have a very brief example of how climate resilience by an, a smallholder organization has really sort of a specific example has really can show people uh, what the difference can be? So we cannot keep uh, lamenting because of, uh, of climate change, uh, as farmers, we believe in, um, in finding solutions for ourselves because we believe we are the solutions to most of the challenges that, that we face. And um, part of our resilience strategy has been on how we can share information on what is happening um, across, but also how we can adopt to some of these changes that are happening, of course, First, we would, would want to see an enabling uh, policy environment, especially you cannot discuss about uh, climate change without discussing land. So usually we, we, we lobby for an enabling uh, policy environment in terms of the land rights. You know, we have different land tenure systems. Also, the pressure on land uh, is becoming so high due to a number of investors, but also the rural urban migration which really creates a lot of pressure on land. But also, there are a number of activities that we, 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 we've been able to train our farmers to put in place, especially on on-farm activities in terms of the good agronomic practices uh, to be able to, to be more climate resilient. We've also tried to make sure that, uh, you know, they are able to adapt to and, and, and be able to access some of the disease and drought tolerant uh, varieties. And also, um, again, other activities uh, across uh, the value chain, 
on the market side, making sure that we bring on board different innovations and also technologies and trying to lobby for infrastructure uh, to share relevant uh, information. As a smallholder yourself, you must be dealing with climate change all the time. Can, can you tell a few of the things you have to think about or do? Uh, maybe if I can start uh, by sharing uh, with our listeners one of the experiences that I had to deal with last year, the second season of last year, uh, because here in Uganda we have two seasons, and the second season usually starts around 15th of August. That's when we usually do uh, the planting. And uh, my field is on, um, is on a slope. So because we expect to plant around 15th and then, of course, for the first um, and second weeks, but being on a slope, then you have to dig contours across the fields to be able, you know, to, to tap uh, the running waters. So it so happened that uh, we received heavy rains uh, that very first week and all my crops were washed away. So, of course, which was a very big loss for me as, as, as a smallholder farmer. And uh, again, not only me, but also other smallholder farmers who are coming from, from, the, same, from the same region, the western uh, region of the country, not only that, but the entire Eastern Africa regions, because usually we have almost the same uh, climate. And, you know, such kind of rains also usually cut off some areas where you have one farm in one place and another farm in another place. And, you know, the infrastructure in rural areas, we usually have poor feeder roads. So usually when, such, um, when we receive such kind of heavy rainfalls, then some parts are usually uh, cut off and makes it inaccessible for, for farmers. So having said that, of course, now that calls for, again, putting in place uh, resilient mechanisms, like I said, uh, making sure that you have continuous dug uh, around the fields, making sure that you have, uh, you know, um, plants, cover crops, um, planted, um, inter interplanted, and also making sure that you have other plants, you know, like animal feeds planted along um, outside the fields, we usually use like coriandra, uh, planting it, you know, at the boundaries of the fields, and we can as well use that as animal feeds. That's really helpful. I think you've really helped to give us a very graphic description of how you have to be thinking and practically on it all the time to keep climate change at bay. So, Duncan, I know that you've been doing recent research and it's sort of talked or I guess shown your evidence a lot about the kind of organised responses that Elizabeth has just been describing. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, certainly. What we are doing at the Forest Farm facility, which is this uh, multi-donor facility that directly supports a uh, small farmer organization and forest organizations. We, we try and uh, co-produce knowledge that helps them. And so we start with surveys of um, these groups uh, to see what their knowledge needs are. And when we did a survey of 41 different forest and farm organizations in six countries, the number one request for information and new knowledge was in the area of climate resilience, options for climate resilience, how to diversify their, their farming so as not to get hit by pests and diseases and so on. And that really made us think we had to give this climate resilience area a bit more priority than, than we were doing. So we've been looking at the um, international literature and we also commissioned 10 forest and farm groups to write case studies of what they were doing to become more climate resilient. And through all of that work, it, it's, it's become clear that there are about 30 different things you can practically do to, uh, to make yourselves more resilient in the face of of climate change and um, these are these are things uh, some things to do with social organization so um, you know you can expand your membership to, 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 to work together 
you can represent your views with government to get fairer tenure and so on. So some of those are, are sort of social organization things. Some of the options are ecological things, like what would you plant on your farm? You can plant more climate-hardy crops, or you can use um, trees to fix nitrogen. You can control erosion, those sorts of things to do with ecology. And then there are things you can do to become more resilient to climate change economically through your businesses. You can become less dependent on a single value chain and, and, and diversify what you sell um, to make you more resilient. And finally, there are things you can do in, in the area of technology and, and physical infrastructure, like you know, putting in, in place irrigation or terracing or boundaries to protect your property from fire, those sorts of things. So there's the, they're very practical things that forest and farm producers are doing. And when we looked at the 10 case studies from around the world, we found that the farmer organizations were doing at least half of the 30 possible options. And I think what that means is that farmer organizations have to be climate resilient in order to survive. They have no option, and they're really rather good at putting in place the things they need to be more resilient. And that's, that's if there's one thing I learned from this whole body of research is that Farmer organizations are excellent at climate resilience. And what they need is more support from us to, to, to be able to finance some of the things they'd like to put in place but can't. And that makes complete sense. People in those situations are working with their, with their daily realities. They know what they need. It's just getting access to resources that can help them do to that. Totally. And I mean, I could give you many practical examples. So, no viva is a little woman's cassava growing cooperative in Togo. And they're faced by more variable rainfall and drought. And so what they've done is they've introduced a, a nitrogen fixing tree, Lucina leucocephala, into their fields. And they lop the leaves of the tree because it provides a nitrogen rich kind of manure effectively for the for the plant then they've gone to the local extension agency and and managed to get more more drought resistant cassava varieties and um, but they haven't just limited it to to the ecological on farm stuff they've they've packaged their cassava products into three or four different things made new labels tried to find new markets they worked with the cereal producers association to get technical and business support and then they joined the national farmers union sitope to kind of represent them in government so it's a small woman's group but it's doing really sophisticated things to become more resilient to climate change <laughs> I'm going to take us to Claire now, because I know, Claire, in your work, trying to think around how to get finance to the local level for people who are doing really considerable achievements in local adaptation, you must have both examples and ideas around how we have to get that finance working. Absolutely, Liz. The story that Duncan just told is one that we've heard again and again. You really can't define how best to adapt to climate impacts at a meta level, at a high level, at the national level or international level. It's so locally specific. And, and local farmers do know what they need. They, they, and when they are organised, they, they, can, they can really influence the processes around them. But when, when we're trying to get resources to them, what we're finding is that it's incredibly high transaction costs, particularly for climate finance. First of all, you have to show the additionality that this is because of climate impacts and not because of, you know, usual development processes. That's one of the requirements in getting climate finance. But secondly, because there's very high expectations of your financial management skills and so on, it tends to be highly intermediated. So the donor gives it to a partner who gives it to another partner who then has a small grant scheme that you have to apply to. 
your ability to influence what the donor's understanding of what your need is, is very limited because of the, it's that number of people that are passing messages to the donor means that you, you don't have a direct voice. The finance coming with climate finance is very short term. And as Duncan and Elizabeth has alluded to, it's often coming as a sort of externally driven uh, solution, somebody else's idea of what is needed. So when about five years ago we looked at how much climate finance was actually intended to reach the local level, um, we found it was about 10%. One in 10 dollars is intended to actually support people on the ground responding to climate impacts. And so more recently we thought, okay, well, for adaptation that must be better because adaptation, you need this very local specific understanding. So we looked at adaptation funding only, and we just looked at the funding going to the very poorest countries, the least developed countries. And what we found was that it's just 3% of what they, the LDCs themselves have estimated their needs were five years ago. So the funding that's arriving now is very much less than what the countries themselves estimate that they needed even some years ago before the current level of climate impacts that we're now seeing. But of this amount, only just under half had any evidence of an intention for local actors to be engaged in defining how that funding gets used. And that's not putting it in the hands of local people. That's just any level of engagement at all. We also found that, um, you know, only 3% was considering gender and the structural inequalities in society. 3% was considering people with disabilities. 2% was thinking about Indigenous peoples. I mean, the the quality of this funding is really, really poor. If you consider what these forest and farmer producer organisations are actually looking for. So to fix this, we do need to go beyond projects. We need to reduce that intermediation. And given the aggregation that that, um, Duncan and Elizabeth were talking about earlier, given that we already have these organised communities that have organised themselves around their production of um, value, those provide a natural platform where finance could be transferred to those institutions and they then pass it on to their local partners on a regular basis. And if you start to provide regular budgets, then local communities, those organised communities, have an opportunity to start to invest long term into what they're going to need. They know what they need today, but if they know that they're going to carry on getting that budget, they can start thinking about what their children might need in the future as well. So this, this shift from projects to institutional processes, these these delivery mechanisms that get the funding and the resources down to the local level. That's what we need to see to fix this this challenge. That's great, Claire. Elizabeth, does does that resonate with you? Yes, sure. I I totally agree and uh, that really uh, resonates with uh, what we are doing as uh, producer organizations and picking it from both Duncan and and, and Claire. uh, I can say that resilience uh, for us is, is looked at at different levels where at policy and representation level, we try and make sure that um, farmers have uh, a common voice. We come up with our farmer led approaches that we can really uh, scale up. And uh, as we speak now, we have a global farmer-led climate resilience um, agenda or campaign. Um, I don't know which right word to use, but uh, it's a a farmer-led process where we are collecting stories from the field in terms of uh, how climate change is affecting um, the farmers, uh, but also in terms of the solutions that uh, farmers are putting in place to be uh, more resilient. So we also use this sort of representation to make sure that farmers' voices are represented at at different meetings, like at the COP, but also uh, engaging with the different stakeholders in terms of uh, information sharing amongst the producer organizations in terms of joint resource mobilization, in terms of organizing uh, peer-to-peer exchanges to be able to help them, you know, to learn from from each other and and be able to share different uh, information. So... Other resilience is also uh, done uh, on farm, where we look at uh, the activities that happen on the farm and how we can support our farmers to be able to to adapt to climate change. I think uh, Duncan Ebri uh, presented on this, where we support our farmers with good uh, agriculture 
practices, we provide them uh, relevant information in terms of being uh, climate smart and also how they can be more adaptive to the, the shocks that you've mentioned about both the, the dry and, and, and the wet shocks, but also uh, the pests and, um, and the diseases. Then on the off-farm activities, also we look at the entire value chain. How do we make sure that our farmers become uh, more innovative, for example, in terms of access to markets? How do we make sure that, um, let's say, they do um, e-marketing where they are facing uh, a number of uh, challenges in terms of uh, access to markets due to issues to do with the uh, climate change? How do they bring in um, technologies? How do you create um, a favorable environment, but also a lobby for infrastructure for our farmers to be more uh, resilient? But uh, what we've learned from all this is that most of the farmers' uh, efforts that they are you know, bringing on board in terms of um, trying to be more resilient is, is really not um, very much, I can say, there is limited appreciation of those uh, efforts. I can say our contribution is not valued. And most often we are branded as a problem to the environment. And yet as farmers, we put in a lot in terms of making sure that we preserve the environment, we protect it for our future generations. And we've also had uh, challenges in terms of access to different services as, as producer organizations. And, and by services, we mean, uh, let's say, access to insurance, access to, to, to financing. I think, as has already uh, been mentioned by, by Claire, when you look at uh, the, the support that is, that is on board for climate resilience, it is uh, mostly accessed by, you know, big uh, corporations. And for smallholder farmers, they end up really not having access to such kind of, um, you know, financing so it really makes it very difficult, even where farmers want to put in place uh, resilient mechanisms, they have such limitations to do with, uh, with financing. And we have, again, some working models as self-generating um, resources uh, in our communities. And these are financial cooperatives, the saving and credit um, associations where, you know, they mobilize their internal resources and lend amongst themselves that are pretty working well. So I believe if this can also be used as channels where such kind of uh, funding maybe can be accessed, it would be uh, an easier and closer uh, route to reach out to, to the uh, producer organizations. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think we really understand, don't we, from what we've talked about this morning, that this group of farm and forest producers and other smallholders, I guess, are a hugely proactive, resourceful, skillful, and kind of on it group of people. But what they need is the certainty that they can find the kind of funding that they need the kind of financial resource that they need to keep things moving and sustainable and to scale where they need to. We need to draw to a close now. Um, and I do like to finish the program with a sort of what change do you want to see immediately? Apart from the obvious ones that we've been talking about, the big ones, what do you think the small change or a change might be right now that could start to get this, this journey to better finance on the way? But I'm going to start with Claire, if I might. A single change, Liz, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> um, I suppose, I mean, the transparency of climate finance is shockingly poor. Donors reported over the last few years about $35 billion going to adaptation in the least developed countries, the poorest countries specifically. When we looked at it, we could only verify 6 billion of that actually had adaptation as a primary objective. Some donors don't provide any detail. Often project names don't align with their own aid transparency websites. So you can't look at the international database and understand what it's actually going on by looking at their websites because they don't use the same names. But this discrepancy between the reported finance and what we could verify is really enabled by the lack of any definition of climate finance. We need to agree what its purpose is, and then that would provide us with a functional definition, and then we could have third-party verification to understand what funding is supporting what and what quality of that funding 
looks like. So we've it's it, we've got too much of the funding that's going to the big corporates that you know reckon that they can solve small farm and forest dwellers problems with a quick fix solution we need much more reaching those forest and farm producer organizations themselves those organized communities local governments who actually understand in their context what they most need to prioritize and even if it's not large amounts that if that funding comes regularly it'll have a big impact so that's that transparency that definition of what climate finance is do is meant to be doing and then this transparency to actually track it i think is the single thing that i would ask for that's really interesting. Thank you. Elizabeth, what's the kind of big change that you want to see happen? You've, t- you've told us about the, the high level I, and there is a lot to do there. But what would a change right now, a particular change right now that would really help move things along? I think like uh, was already mentioned by, by, by CREA. I think uh, transparency in climate finance is, is very critical. And um, in addition to that, we really need to see um, self-accountability for our actions and contribution to climate change. We need to hold each other accountable. But as we also hold each other accountable, we need to see that there is this uh, you know, rebalancing of uh, of the benefits and losses that we usually have uh, across the, the, the very chains. So that it's, on, it's not only the farmers to feel the losses, but where the benefits, then farmers should also, you know, benefit from those benefits. We need to value uh, the contribution of each and everyone in terms of monetary terms. As farmers, when we put in a lot to make sure that uh, we become more resilient, we preserve the environment what comes back to us. That is why we are calling for equal partnerships, you know, being respected as also partners in, in making sure that uh, we, we, we become uh, more climate uh, resilient. Thank you. So we've got transparency, we've got accountability, we've got better benefit sharing, and we've got more equal partnerships. Duncan, what, what would be your change now that you would be advocating? Thanks, Liz. Yes, I think uh, my first emphasis would be, would be on that word now, the immediacy of what change needs to happen. And that's because by 2050, if we do nothing, we're expecting to see 250,000 additional deaths from heat and, and related mortality, an additional 529,000 deaths from food shortages, and 720 million people pushed into extreme poverty. So we can't ignore climate resilience. My main change would be that at the moment, the main climate funds are channeling their money through accredited agencies. And the accreditation processes are choosing certain types of organization that are deemed fit to channel funding. And they don't currently involve the farmer organizations. And I would turn that around and say, unless your accreditation process is directly selecting and channeling funds through farmer organizations, then you're missing the people who can actually do something about climate resilience. So that would be my main change. That's brilliant. That's very clear from all of you. It's clear that there are changes that could be made, that this is possible. And I know that IID and our partners and colleagues will be working to share those messages in the key moments and events during this super year. So thank you again to my guests today. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your experience and ideas. I hope you, our listeners, will agree that we've had a lot to think about. And during this very busy time in the super year, when there will be lots of interest in these issues, please do tell friends, colleagues, and anyone you think who's working on this about this podcast. And of course, if you want more in-depth detail, the IIED website will provide lots of links to more publications and blogs to explore. And you can find out more about today's podcast, our guests, and their work at www.iied.org slash podcast, where you can also listen to more episodes. You can leave us feedback or follow the podcast series at soundcloud.com slash the IIED. 
podcast is produced by our in-house communication team. For more information about IIAD and our work, please visit us at www.iied.org.